Good morning, everybody. I am Hugo, the CEO and founder of Team 212, and Jeff. I'm Jeff Eshelman. I am an executive coach and a former 30-year corporate warrior and a former battlefield warrior. And today I am a coach at Team 212. Yeah, I actually... I uh, apologize. I completely reversed the order. Usually I, I let you introduce yourself before I do myself. But uh, either way, today we're talking about focus and focus in every area of your life. And the reason I, I think I introduced myself is to get out of the way because I want to actually hear a lot from you, Jeff, at the beginning of this. And talk, we're going to talk about um, how focus enhances your finance and business life, your family life, your fitness life, and I, I want to go into how focus can enhance your fun life. So um, we'll start with finance and business. Jeff, w when I first met you, you uh, were or and are in a in a in a good financial place. It's at least at least from the from my perspective, seemed very like you you put some planning into your financial situation. And I want to hear if that was by accident. <laughs> well, I mean, accident by. <laughs> The fact that I wasn't doing it well <laughs> in the beginning, and I didn't, uh, and I didn't like the way that that felt, right? Like either not having money in the bank or having, you know, money on credit cards and things. You know what? What I come to find out after I read read me a little Dave Ramsey and incorporated into that that into my life that I was paying a lot of what he calls stupid tax, right? So after I figured that out. I, you know, stopped doing the what I now refer to as the wrong thing, right? Buying on credit and and things of that nature. And I took a more intentional approach, which was just ask higher level questions about what I wanted out of life. You know, we talk a lot about that on the podcast. And so get intentional about what you want and then create a plan to get there. But the focus right for me was and sometimes it just takes like a really great word picture and i one of the the most powerful things i ever heard was jim Rohn say build a financial wall around your family that nothing can tear down and that from uh, like i just stopped in my tracks and i'm like wow i like the i like the sound of that now when I heard that, you know, I was broke and living in a one bedroom apartment and I didn't even have Dave Ramsey baby step number one, which is a thousand dollars in savings. And that was at age 38, 39. Right. So it wasn't all that long ago. Right. I mean, it was more than 10 years ago, but not much more. Right. And so to uh, the other thing I like to tell people is through clarity and focus and execution, right? You can, over time, you can turn your life around regardless of where you're at. And that's what I love is we always just get to decide is the way things are going for us okay or not. And so the focus piece, you know, for me, it was the financial wall around my family, right? And so I started focusing and we, we talk a lot when we talk about goal setting about the power of why and getting power over yourself and and having that, like that was that was powerful for me because the figure that I had for myself was as a provider, as a, you know, a father and a husband and all these other roles that I have in my life. And I felt like I was, you know, shirking my responsibilities, right? Like I hadn't done well in that area. So I told myself, Hey, you better figure this out, get smarter, read some better books, take some different action, right? That kind of thing. But it was focusing on, you know, what those ends in mind, if, if I was going to create a financial wall around my family, that meant that my income needed to be X, right? And so I'm always a big proponent. I mean, what, what's the old adage, you, you know, like you're never going to save your way to financial success, right? So if, and sit, don't get me wrong, saving is an important part of the equation. And those are metrics and focus that I have around my savings, both liquid and semi-liquid and longer term. And we can talk about any of those things that you want to talk about, but the front end part of the equation, right? So if you're in a business, it's sales, right? You have to go out there and get sales so you can move the product and you can get the revenue that you can ultimately get the product. And in your own life, 
if you're not running a business, if you're a W2 person out there working like, you know, I was for the last 30 years, you climb the ladder, right? You build your, you build your skills, you build your abilities, you know, like depending on what organization you work in, you know, the, the ladder is unlimited, right? You can climb as high as you want. And if you've climbed the ladder as high as you can in your current organization, there's, then you just start looking at other places and say, you know, how, how can I do this? So that's, that's, that's a starter on, tell, tell me where you want to go from there. That's, I'm glad you mentioned all of that. I actually want to start with a financial wall. Um, okay. And then, and then I want to end this finance section with a deep dive on income versus savings. So we'll get into income versus savings in a second, but building that financial wall is such a powerful visual. And I can actually feel it. It's almost like something where I, when I, you know, I didn't even have to close my eyes, but when I imagine that financial wall around me and my family, I feel the security. And I, I think that's a powerful exercise to just see how would you visualize what you're trying to accomplish? Um, that's like mindset stuff. Now you talked about Dave Ramsey and I, I, I have a love hate relationship with Dave Ramsey. Um, Dave Ramsey helped me get out, helped me and my wife and my family get out of $25,000 worth credit card debt when we were, when, you know, my, even my income wasn't, you know, I don't even, honestly, I don't even know how we did it, but he talks about the gazelle like focus. And that was the thing that really helped. Um, I mean, there was also the envelope system. So when I think about Dave Ramsey, he's, he's kind of like a tactical guy, right? Like here's how you tactically accomplish the goal, but you know, but then there's, um, and I don't remember the author, but this, there's a book called the psychology of money and the psychology of money talks about what money means beyond the idea of um, like security. I mean, including security, but beyond that, like status and what, what is our psychology around? You know, there's people who are financially more secure than, than most of the country, but still feel like there's a lack mindset. So those, in the, when we talk about that, I think that's a really good general area to explore. But if I want to go specifically into income versus savings because you said it and, and i think it was really good how you broke it down which is you know you can control your income w way more you can't save yourself to prosperity right you can control your income way more and you laid it out with its sales wh whether you know whether you're in a as an employee right anything that you can do to contribute to sales of your company that's in increasing income you're learning how to build income and then, you know, you're also building skills, skills and abilities. I, I think it really comes down to those, you know, fundamental skills and abilities. What skills and abilities do you have and how can you generate income that way? Um, what, what are your thoughts? And let's go deeper into income versus savings. Well, so I, the only word I would substitute, you, you were saying control. You, you can control your income. Um, I, I think you can control your savings. As a matter of fact, I think that's the part of focus that we're talking about here. I, I'm an objectives guy, right? So let's just keep using Dave Ramsey. The very first baby step I had when I was broken in my one bedroom apartment was I need to get to $1,000 of savings, what he calls an emergency fund, right? Now, I'll tell you over the last 10 years, I've grown my idea of what an emergency fund is, right? The, the idea being a higher number, right? Than a thousand dollars, but that's what he has in the book. And that's what he recommends for baby step number one. And that's before you even start paying credit cards off. So that's the power of focus. The word you were using is control. I would rather use the word scale, right? So what I was really saying when I said, you'll, you'll never save your way to success is now, certainly you can scale your savings or it's really similar to what you said before. Is you paid off twenty five thousand dollars and you're not even sure how you did it. But it's by like following what we talk about here at Team 212. You decided what you wanted. You built a plan to do it. You got to work doing it. And now even looking back how many ever years later, you can't even exactly remember how it all worked. But in a handful of years, you paid off twenty five grand. Right. And it's like, well, isn't that beautiful? Right. So that's what we're talking about here and focus being the specific part of it. So in, instead of control, I'd say scale, right? So you can scale, I mean, you could scale either, but the, the, what I'm trying to articulate is scaling your income, just like scaling sales is a really powerful way to do it. Because when you're talking about the top line, like the money coming in, right? And scaling that up, 
yeah that is what like it just feels exponential right because it it's not even just i don't want to get all woo woo here like when i what i was going to say is like well it's not even just you right but it is you have to start the equation right if you have a grander vision of where you are right now let's say you're focused on building that financial wall for your family and let's see let's after Dave Ramsey. Okay. So let's use after you pay off credit cards, like one of the, maybe it's the last step, pay off your house. Right. So that was a big part of the financial wall that I had in my mind was to pay off my house and put myself in a, in just a, that kind of position. And so the best way for me to do that was to increase my income on the front end. Right. If I earned a higher wage in my role that I had, or if I worked my way up the corporate ladder and I got to a position that had, you know, really healthy bonuses, or I was pretty fortunate to work for public companies where you also got stocks and things of that nature, if, you know, depending on your role in the organization and then depending on how well things went in the market, right? You could be financially rewarded in different ways. And so that's what I mean about scale. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think mine is kind of a fun story to tell about that for skill up uh, for scale is because I think I'm the, the almost the anti poster child. Right. And I'm not proud of the fact that I never went to college. A matter of fact, it's one of the biggest regrets that I have in my life is not going to college. But in spite of being a, a regret, like I'm not a school guy, like I, I didn't do well in high school. You and I have talked about our you know, little mediocre paths, you know, through the public school system. And I knew when I graduated high school with my little whatever GPA I had, you know, like they let me have a diploma. Thank you. Right. <laughs> I was never going back. And so I've never sought out that kind of education, although it led to my downfall by the time I was 38 years old and I'd never read any more books and I hadn't got any smarter and I didn't, you know, I'd driven my finances and my health into the ground. Right. And so that's why I had to, you know, take the Dave Ramsey and my little one bedroom broke apartment and figure it out. Right. But I was able to. And but and just like you've already said, you can use your skills. You can improve your abilities. Right. Like being a better speaker. We've both been to Toastmasters. It's been a big part of our life and our success. Right. I mean, how much does Toastmasters cost? Five thousand dollars a month? Yeah. No. Right. <laughs> Does it cost maybe maybe a hundred dollars, you know, or hundred and fifty bucks a quarter or something, right? So for yeah. six hundred dollars a year, would you go pay and invest some time into, you know, a, a skill set that could not only improve the maybe your business or your sales or as a leadership, but you know, maybe just to have a conversation with your kids or to get up and you know deliver a eulogy for somebody that was really close to you or to you know, say be, to be the best man at somebody's wedding and, you know, say something really special in 30 seconds mm -hmm. versus like most stories that you hear about people's speeches that they have when they're the best man where they, you know, step on their own tongue or, you know, they've already had a half a bowl of punch or what, you know, you know how it goes, right? <laughs> I've been there. I've been, <laughs> I've, been, I've been at those weddings. Right. Um, yeah. You know, when you, you talked about a lot of things, and I, I think it, it, one of the things that you mentioned is is spending your money, like you, you, the example you gave about spending your money on Toastmasters. When I think about focus and in finance, I think about also like, can you focus how you utilize your fin the, the limited financial resources that you may have? Where, you know, you, you think about that example of Toastmasters. Yeah, like I think our club is is on the higher side and it's about $600 a year or so. And the... The old me would have said that's six hundred dollars more than what I want to spend to get in front of people and talk. Um, that's the old me. But now, after not only just investing in that and investing in other courses, I've realized that the value that I get not only is it like does it correspond to the amount of money that I pay. Sometimes, sometimes if you pay more for something, you value it more. But the amount of effort and time that you put into it also. It, you know, you can pay $600 for a public speaking course, but if you're in there every day practicing, prepping, and then every week putting it in your all, you're going to get $6,000 worth of money from that uh, that investment. So it's key that we 
our focus where we spend our money and making sure that we're getting our return. Not just, you know, one of the worst things you can do is purchase a course. You know, there's kind of different levels, right? You purchase a course and you go all in and you say, I'm going to, I'm going to invest into this program and I'm going to go all in and you get your money's worth or you purchase it and then you, you do the program and then afterwards you take nothing with you. And then you, you know, that's, that's that amount of value or you purchase a, a, a course or program and you never even start past the introduction. And you just feel good because you spent some money on on right. investing in yourself. But the the focus that you put on that is kind of dissipated. It's gone, you know? Yeah. If we have enough time after we wrap up the the business part of the finance that you wanted to get in, maybe we should just talk a little bit about time, right? Because when we're talking about focus and on, I mean, that's the subject today is focus. And yeah. time is the is the thing that you, you know, you've heard the old analogy because we're talking about finance. Like, you could throw all your money in the trash right now. And if mm. you've already figured out how to earn money, like that, that's what they, you know, what Grant Cardoon, you know, like blindfold him and drop him out of his own personal jet. Right. <laughs> and he'll be a millionaire in another six months. Right. Yeah. Because yeah. he's, he, it, it's not the, it, it's not the situation, right. It's the, it's the skills and the abilities and the mindset that he has not, not to lift. I'm not trying to lift Grant Cardone up here, but anyway, just, a, a good example of that versus time is finite. Like Grant Cardone can't buy any more time than you and I have, right? And so if we have some discretionary time, I don't know if we will, we should maybe it, talk about time. I think that's a perfect, um, so, so the next the next segment is family. And I think, you know, talking about time in between finance and family sandwiched in between those two topics is probably the best place, right? Because so yeah, you're talking about time versus income and money but it, and it also applies to everything that we're talking about so yeah riff on time but go yeah. ahead well how, how about how about you let me insert the business finance piece real quick and then we just roll into time let's do it right so one of the most powerful things that i've ever figured out about focus in business was around the financial piece and and it starts with more than just the financial but obviously it's a business right so it's there to create revenue and earn profits for either a private company, public, private equity, all these different mechanisms to create wealth, uh, to create, you know, revenue. And so that it usually starts out ahead of that. So even ahead of finance, where you're talking about what are the fundamentals, like what's important to an organization, like the let's something that that is really universal is like product quality, like creating a great product is an important starting place or having good customer service, right? It could be the best meal in the world, but if it gets served to you cold, right? That's, that's a great product that's not served well, right? So you have these fundamental things like, again, people, you know, who are the people in your organization, all these things that make for a good company. But at the end of the day, you get down to finance. That's why you're getting together as a group is to earn money, either mm -hmm. for the corporation or for the private company, things of that nature. So the fundamentals, though, of focus here on finance are, first of all, it's the visibility. Can you see where you're at? And this, I'll tell you, even since I went into executive coaching, this is so shocking to me when I go start working with companies and I find out how little visibility they have on their own finances, wh whether it be just as basic as the P and L, like where's the money, you know, going out the door, or like accurate cash flows, all of these things, right? Like it, there's just this whole range. And so I'm a big pro proponent of a one page plan. I'm so much a proponent. I created one for my life and that's what I help my clients with. But we ran a one page plan in our business, which said every year exactly who we were. The left side of the plan was all the who we are, our core values and core competencies and purpose and customer and all that stuff that I just mentioned. And the right side of the page was all about our goals, right? And KPIs. And some of them were written goals about strategy type things, but make no mistake, <laughs> there was a revenue goal, there was a profit goal, there was a sales goal that drove both of those, right? There was a, uh, if you're familiar with SGNA, right? So sales, general and administrative. So 
that's the efficiency of your business, right? So how, you know, every new person that you add to the team, hey, great, you've added a new person, but you've also added another mouth to feed, right? So the more efficient that you can be as a business is your, you know, ultimately it gets down to your margin. So for every widget that you sell versus all your cost of a company, here's our margin in the end, right? Mm -hmm. So having focus and clarity around what those metrics are and what they should be, need to be, right, is the starting point and paramount. But here's the second part. And for every business that I do that run in, that I run into that has those things, here's the second part that they lack. They don't have the timing. They don't have the regularity. They have the metrics, but they don't have a mechanism where the team is using the information in a repeatable kind of a way. And for every organization that does have it locked up and maybe the leadership team is doing that, which is you know how the business continues to live, the companies that don't even know where they're going are usually the kind that go out of business. Hmm. I mean, you can go out of business even if you're doing things right, if you get a left hook from you know, COVID and you were the, you know, cruise ship business, right? Like that, that kind of thing can just take people out. But if you don't have that strategy up front and then you don't have the visibility, those are typically the kind of companies that go out of business. The kind of companies that weather the storm are the ones where the leadership team and everybody knows what the metrics are and where we're going. And then here's the last part. The teams that I've been a part of that were super successful is where everybody on the team, like everybody from the president to the receptionist to the person in the field to the, you know, we didn't have a janitor, but you know, like to the person, you know, clean sweep in the hallways, right? If they know what the financials are and then they know what their role is in success, man, that is the holy grail of creating a successful business to me. I think that last piece of having everybody know and be clear and, and what the goals are, what these KPIs are, and and then even having everybody be invested in, in actually moving those numbers forward, regard, like you said, regardless of what your position is. Um, I know that when I worked in corporate, I was in support. But one of the big things is like, you know, any kind of opportunity where we, we can make not to say upsell, but like, hey, this customer mentioned that they needed this tool. Let's let's transfer them over to sales after this call or ask, you know, depending on the culture of the of the product. We were in a software uh, software product. So it made sense to say, hey, you know, you mentioned that you're struggling with this in, in the system. There's a feature in our in our package that actually allows that. And, you know, regardless of what team you are, you're in, if you're aware of those metrics, you're going to make the effort to say, let me get you over to the right person that can help you. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's beautiful. Cool. Uh, I don't think I can add much more than that. And I think it's a good transition because we, we were talking about time and I yeah. want to, I want to have that conversation about time going from, you know, I, I mentioned time in the sense of like, don't just invest your money into something, but also invest your time. And this for me started because I read the book. I don't, I don't even remember what book it was, but it was basically a book that said, suggested spending a certain percentage. I think it was like 10% of my time learning and or you know it wasn't even no that's what not it's not what it was it was 10 percent of my money learning but when i looked at it i was like well i could spend 10 percent of my money but if i don't invest the time i'm just wasting my money so i flipped it and said i'm going to spend 10 percent of my time learning and doing that really helped me say okay i see the tie between my time invested in something in this case educating myself and the output and the result that i got and i think that I, that really helped me understand why time, quality time with your f family, the people that you love, is actually critical to developing those relationships. It's just, it's not just about like, hey, yeah, I'm there every once in a while and I'm there, you know, uh, to, to be there for you like regularly. It's how much time are you spending? How focused are you? So what, what, are, what are your thoughts, uh, Jeff? Co couple of things. So first of all, I love the fact that you've been using the term invest. Right. So if I'm going to invest my money or I'm going to invest my time into getting better, because I think I'll, oftentimes people think like, well, what's it going to cost? OK, mm -hmm. what's it going to cost to go to Toastmasters? If you want to go to our club, it's 600 bucks a year. Right. 
So like, well, what's that going to cost me? Like, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be as much concerned about what it's going to cost as the investment that you're getting ready to make. So I love that. So let's break it down real quick. Let's say uh, we made, each of us made $50 an hour, right? And our average Toastmasters meeting is 90 minutes. And if it even took you 15 or 20 minutes to get there each way, you've pretty easily got three hours invested into a Friday morning to get to our Toastmasters club and do the round trip, correct? Yeah. So 150 bucks, right? Yeah. How many meetings do you have to go to to get over 600 bucks? Only four. If <laughs> yeah. you went to every week for a month, you would spend more money and time than you ever spent for the whole year of being in the room, right? Yeah. So when, when we talk about time, that's why I like to say, you know, that whole, you know, back to Grant Cardone, like he can't buy any more time than you and I have. But when we talk about the investment or focus, right? This is why I love to use time. And that's why we just use the, what would the investment be into? We, we've invested far more into Toastmasters with our energy and our time than we have in dollars, right? Mm -hmm. So, and it's important to us. So we, we feel like we're getting ROI, return on our investment. But now let's go ahead and just poke the audience square in the eye, right? Which is when, when you ask people like, well, how come you don't have time to have written goals or how come you don't have time? I mean, it seems like you have time to be, you know, 30 to 50 pounds overweight, right? You have time to go out to a meal at your local restaurant and take, you know, uh, whatever, you know, it takes more time to go have the meal than it does to Toastmasters. And you're going to pay, you know, on average of 80 to 100 or $150, depending on where you're going, right? Each time. And that's a meal, right? And so you don't have time to have written goals or you don't have time to focus on the future or you don't have time to focus on, you know, what we've been suggesting here, which is, you know, the, the basics of your 401k or your salary or your uh, skill set to earn a living or any of these things. OK, so maybe we give you a pass on going out to dinner. But, you know, like how much time are you on social? How much time do you consume, you know, streaming video, you know, things of that nature? Right. Like you ever I'm not I mean, I'm only just trying to poke the eye here just to get somebody to realize like you're investing your time right? This very precious commodity that none of us will ever get back. Today is the first day of February of 2024. And at the end of this day, we're never going to get this back. And I'm, I'm 53. You're fortunate to be in your, what are your early I'm 40. years? I'm 40. Yeah. yeah you, you got so much more time than me, Hugo. Um, <laughs> my point is we don't get it back, right? And, you know, what, what's that classic example of they ask people on their deathbed? You know, nobody says, you know, I wish I would have been a better, uh, you know, worker. I wish I would have had just two more dollars in the bank. Like nobody says that, right? Mm -hmm. They wish they would have spent more time with their spouse or smiling more or going outside and soaking up the sunshine or, you know, all the things that people that are on their deathbed say. But today... On the 1st of February of 2024, it's an opportunity to focus, right? Take a lesson learned from somebody that's about to die or take a lesson learned, like from me, of somebody who's crashed their life into a wall, right? And picked it back up and dusted it off and learned some new skills and done some different things. And now I'm leading, nobody has a perfect life, right? But I'm right now, I'm living my best life. Right. And I've created it. Right. And intentionally and through focus and all of these other things. And and that's the I think that's really the, the journey that we're inviting our our teams and our audience on is like taking your own responsibility, focusing on something different, doing things different. That is beautiful. Um, I think it's a perfect transition into focusing your time and that time that you can't get back on the people that are here to, that, that that you love that make you feel you know worth living like a life worth living and you know i'll, I'll tell you I, i'll i will confess something it's kind of horrible <laughs> i used to um 
I used to work the night shift at a call center. This is like when I was 21. And I used to work the night shift and I bought myself a gaming laptop. We would get maybe two phone calls a night and I would play video games all eight hours of my shift. And then I would come home and I would fire up the laptop and play a couple more hours. <laughs> no joke. It was, it, you know, it is, I, I, it's definitely like a story that teaches me a couple of things. Number one, self-control. I had no self-control at that moment. And number two, diminishing returns. There was a point where, you know, I'm not, I love video games. I'm not telling you don't spend your time on video games. Right. I'm just saying there's a certain amount of time where you feel like, okay, I, I feel good about this. And then it's like, what else can I spend my time on or doing? Right. And that didn't mean, you know, that doesn't mean that you have to do something that's not fun. I'll get into the fun category, but just, mm -hmm. it, it just means that sometimes we sink time into something, hoping to get more of that good feeling when what we do is we realize it's empty. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to talk about that in right before we talk about family time, because it's critical that when we're spending time with the people we love, it's, it's focused. You're not distracted thinking about the, the work that you're not getting to, because that was one of my big things is when I would spend my time with my family, my mind was already thinking about what I'm not doing at work or what I could be doing. And then, you know, uh, the other al alternative is I would spend my time with family, but not present, like, like there with them, but doing something where we're disconnected. You right. know, a good example of that is watching TV. Sometimes watching TV can be fun if you're watching something that you all enjoy and maybe have a conversation before or after, or, you know, it, it brings you together, but sure. oftentimes there's that like mindless watching something that doesn't even bring any value to anybody in the, in the room. So I, I wanted to mention those two things to talk about, hopefully a way to transition into how do you turn, okay, I'm spending time with family, but how do I focus to make that time the most valuable? Um, so I wanted to share that. I don't know if, if you can relate or if you have an opposite experience, what are your thoughts? No, I, I, really resonate with with what you were saying right there and and the i the key word that you used uh is what i have on my carpe diem which is the word presence right so the the to to turn the word focus which is the topic of our conversation today into how i like to work it in my relationship category and on my carpe diem it's under the love category right and so within love i i have a statement on mine that says loving man, father, son, grandfather, friend, and coach. And then the number one virtue that I can exhibit for that is to be present with my attention. And so that's my relationship version of focus, right? And so the best way to make that happen, at least that I found, and there's plenty of ways to do it, is like many things, it's to be intentional, right? And so I've created the kind of lifestyle right now where every morning at my house between 630 in the morning and 730, uh, I've still got a 12 year old at home. And that's the time that in between the time that he gets out of bed and has got to be on the bus. And that is a time where, you know, sometimes I, I will have some small activities that are available for me to do, but it's really a time for us to connect before he ends up on that bus and at school all day, where again, I'm going to see him in the afternoon when he gets off the bus, but you know, then I've got this whole work time and other things. And there are other times through the weekend where we bond and things of that nature. But, and again, that might not be possible for everybody. That wasn't possible in my corporate life because I was already out the door and, you know, and I had to find other ways. But if you're intentional and you look for ways, right? Like if you're the corporate warrior that I once was, then, okay, well, what are you doing to craft some time in the weekend where you can bond with your 12 year old or fill in the blanks, eight year old, five year old, you know, 20 year old. Right. And, and that's a good segue. So I I've got that one child at home, but I've got three adult kids that are out living, you know, their best life. And I, I, you remember, because I brought this up on our teams last year, probably like mid year, when I said, hey, I've got these two older boys. And for some reason, I reach out and talk to my daughter almost every week. We have a conversation. We just, you know, very natural, that kind of thing. But I'm like, I haven't talked to my boy in like 45 days, 60 days. I'm like, well, that's too long. 
right? And so I started saying to myself, like, what am I going to do? Like, I have to change what I'm doing so that I connect with these older two boys on some frequency. And for me, it was weekly. I'm like, okay, well, at least send them a text or pick up the phone and call or, you know, any of these things, because I, I, I realized to myself, and that's how life works, right? We get busy doing everything, right? The, the whole, you know, and so again, that's what's intentional and focused, bring those things, bring those things back. Yeah. Uh, I relate to your story of, of connecting with your boys. I, rem I, I remember that. I remember you, you know, that's one of the great things about our accountability group is we're constantly checking in on ourselves. It's like, am I, am I living to the full potential that I, I want to be at? And it, that means engaging with my, my, all of my kids. And, you know, so what, what I've found worked for me, um, there's a couple of things. First of all, for me, it was including the kids in my planning for the fun activity, whatever that fun activity was. So uh, there's two goals, two key family goals that I set this year. And I actually, these are carryovers from last year. These worked so well last year that I carried them over. Um, one is going on adventures every week and going on an adventure with my kids means anything from going to the park. My kids are, I have a four-year-old and I have a 12-year-old and a 13-year-old. So anything from going to the park, going to the library, going to a new, even a new um, like store that we haven't visited before. That's something fun and adventurous for us to check out. Th those are adventures. And I will check with them and I'll say, hey, what do you, what adventure do you guys want to go on this month? And then we'll sit and think about like, hey, we'd like to go to um, the water park during the summer months. That's usually one of the big ones. Mm -hmm. So doing that, getting them involved, not only makes that time that you're doing the activity fun and con a connecting point, but everything leading up to it, all the excitement in between the planning and actually having that event, it's, it's all like positive. The other thing is doing... One of the key things I found out is you, if you're going to bond with somebody and, and this this applies to not just your kids, to anybody, but I want to give the example of my kids, do something that they enjoy. <laughs> Don't, you know, like, hey, it's not like we're going to go watch the next action, the next big action movie. And your wife's like, well, I don't I don't want to watch that movie. I want to watch right. the Barbie movie. I'm right. Stereotyping. This is the real world example of my wife. She's like, oh, uh, so. All right. Let's go watch the Barbie movie. That's something that you want to watch. Um, enjoying the time, making sure that both and everybody is having a good time. Not that you have to have a good time, but that it's primed for that. Um, and no better way has this really um, worked out for me than in with Dungeons and Dragons. So that's the second goal is Dungeons and Dragons with my kids. I've, you know, I always loved the idea of playing Dungeons and Dragons, but I didn't have enough friends who were into it to play ever. And um <laughs> when my kids showed some interest, I bought all the books and all the, the dice and everything, but they were too young to like really get it. And th th last year we finally said, okay, we're going to learn how to play it. We're going to learn how to play Dungeons and Dragons. We're going to spend all this time preparing for it. And then we're going to do an adventure. And they loved it. They loved the acting out the, the, the scenarios. They loved planning for it, building their character. Um, and then it allowed us to engage in a way where we like, it was, it's role-playing. We're like mm -hmm. literally acting these characters and I get to see my kids and my wife behave and interact in ways that I would never have. So this is doing things that are novel is another yeah. like secret weapon. So Beautiful. I love that. Beautiful. Cool. All right. So let's go into, we, we talked about finance. We talked about family. I want to touch on fitness before we get into fun. So fun is the last one. I'll save that the best for last, but fitness Focus in fitness. Um, you and I both have had fitness journeys. We've talked about it several times on the podcast. Um, for me, and I, I'll just, I, I think this is pretty straightforward for me. It is really understanding what my specific goal is. This is what's worked for me. When I just say I want to lose weight or I want to get healthy or I want to get in shape or be more active, it doesn't work for me because I can trick myself into thinking, hey, this, you know, I, this is healthy. This is an alternative to what I used to eat or you know, this is, this is better than what I did before. So it's good right. enough. Right. When I have a target that allows me to focus. And that's what I did. I set a target for my weight. And I said, this is the way I want to be. This is the body fat percentage. And that allowed everything else around it to go, okay, in order for you to get that goal, what needs to change in your life? So the goal itself 
was the focus and my behaviors and habits adapted to fit that goal, which is like reducing what I, the junk food that I ate, making it a habit to do cardio four to seven times a week, depending on the week, um, weightlifting, all of that. Yep. So what are your thoughts on what, what does work for you as far as focus and fitness? Yeah, I'll, I'll use a popular saying from business to guide what I do in my personal life for fitness, which is what gets measured gets done. Right. Yeah. And so I'll use this example. I just finished 75 hard a couple of weeks ago. I, I'm down to an all new low, like body fat percentage, that kind of thing. But it it can either be the process goal, like you just mentioned, the like the number of times that you're going to do cardio in any given week. Or it can be, you know, the focus of, listen, like I need to write a number in the box here, right? And another fun Jim Rohn thing, he would always say, you know, if somebody started making an excuse, somebody in his employee would say, hey, the problem with your that whole dissertation there is that won't fit in my box. Like what I need to write in here is a number, right? Like what is your body fat percentage today? Let's see you jump up there on the scale and we're going to write a number in this box, right? And if, if you have those outcome goals, we talk a lot about this in the other podcast, right? An outcome goal is What's the body fat percentage that I'm going to write in the box? And then a process goal is like you mentioned, right? Which is I've got a system in place that makes sure that my wife doesn't buy those kind of cookies. Or when I go grocery shopping, I don't buy those kind of chips because I don't have that stuff in the house because I know, you know, whatever chemical they put in there makes me, you know, like once you put the first chip in your mouth, right? It, it's followed by 23 or the whole bag, right? <laughs> Because, right, and and that's a process goal is to not have that because we want to be able to use our willpower wisely, right? We don't want to buy things and taunt them in front of us, right, if, if we don't have to, right? And that doesn't mean we need to live, you know, like monks and a life of, you know, purity and all this other stuff, right? We can, you know, I think, like you said, with uh, with computer gaming and, you know, like, when when is a good thing become not a good thing? Right. And all of us make up our own mind on what that is. And, and clearly you came to your own. But for me, it's what get what gets measured gets done. Yeah, uh, I can picture. I think I don't I've never heard that phrase before, but the, the, the idea of your excuses don't fit in this box. I love that. And I and I think I'll use that for myself. Yeah. My excuses won't fit in the box. Um, you, you know, one of the things about fitness that you talked about is like Set, setting your environment up for success, right? Like don't have the chips in the house if you're, if you know those are a weak point. And just yesterday, we're all, today's February 1st. Yesterday I did my, my monthly reflection. And as part of my reflection process, I look at what do I need to adjust? And in my, in my, what do I need to adjust for fitness? I wrote, I need to not have any more chips. And I, <laughs> I wrote this as a commitment. And then I went out and I told my wife, they were outside playing foot, play, playing catch with the football. I told my wife and kids, I said, hey, everybody, if you see me grab a chip, remind me that I said I'm not going to eat any more chips. And I was, I was committing to doing it for the rest of the quarter. And then I come back and I finish, <laughs> I finish my reflection and then I pause and I go back out there and I go, hey, never mind about the chips. <laughs> never mind about the chips. And the reason is because I realized that type of doing that, having that type of restriction will just help me encourage me to cheat somewhere else, find, you know, maybe stop yeah. buying grab a bag of chips. Right. What really needs to happen, and, and I think it's critical that you don't have chips everywhere, is how, being aware of how you react, right? Like for me, I realized that I would just automatically start going towards the cupboard for the chips and I would watch myself, not judging, but just observing. If, um, I think it's Phil Collins. So there, there is a book. I don't even remember what the what, what the book is, but there's a there's an author who talks about observing yourself like if you were a bug, and um, observing yourself in a way where you're just disconnected and just saying, "Hmm, this odd. This guy keeps eating these chips. What is what is happening right before he's eating the chips?" And I realize it's like, okay, I'm nervous about something. I'm trying to take my mind off of something that I need to do. So that helped me get to the bottom line of why I was eating the chips. And then I didn't have to get rid of them. Now, in this scenario, I was instantly going, okay, I got to get rid of the chips. But the reality is I really have to be aware of what's causing it. And then 
I set myself up to make sure that I don't hit those um, roadblocks, right? Like, okay, so when I do get busy, when I feel like eating a chip, what I'll do is instead do some push-ups. And doing those push-ups just takes my mind off of that. Mm -hmm. So that, that's how I focus myself in that area. I, I, it sounds like you can relate to that, yeah, right? For sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so transitioning, this is my favorite part. And I kind of kind of hinted at this earlier when I talked about the video games, but fun. <laughs> fun. Uh, when I started my personal development journey, I, I was that guy who would play eight plus hours of video games a day. Even like even down to maybe 10 years ago, I still would play like that many, that much video games. Even though I was performing in other areas of my life, I was playing so many video games because I was obviously neglecting certain areas. And what I realized is I wasn't enjoying the time that I was spending playing video games. I was, I was, I was struggling with certain parts of the game. I was not liking certain things. And it made me question, well, then why am I spending my time with this? What's really happening here? And then I just completely eliminated that aspect and, and started focusing on different areas that brought me joy. And I realized, okay, if I focus, if I'm focused, then I can, I can for me, art brings me joy. That's fun. Creating art, um, reading comic books. I started finding other things that brought me joy. And then I was able to bring in the video games back in and say, okay, what video games are really bringing joy? And I was able to quantify like how much fun, not in a like scientific way, but just in, like in a feeling way. Like, do I feel a low level of fun, a medium level of fun, or this is like a, a, a high level of fun. And, and I think it's important to understand what, what is actually fun for you and how do you incorporate time for that? So I'm going to ask you, Jeff, I don't, this is actually probably something that I'm not too familiar with in your life is what, what bring, what brings you joy? What's something that you do for fun? Sure. Well, I'm going to use a couple examples here and I'm, I'm going to segue the word from fun to what I use in my own life and with my clients as what I call lifestyle. And again, this is just direct learning from Jim Rohn. So I'll use a couple of examples. So you could put this in the, I put it in the category of fun, right? And so we were earlier talking about finances and, you know, whatever, a handful of years ago, I wasn't doing so well. But what I've also emerged after financially doing better is a person who gives more, right? So like, Imagine how much fun you can have once you get to a certain level of abundance that things in your life or day to day are taken care of. And then you want to, uh, you know, contribute to I'm a veteran. Right. So like veterans organizations are, you know, like really important to me, wounded warrior and stuff like that. Or, you know, like all you have to do is drive around. Right. You can see that like homelessness, for example, is it's growing right between the epidemic of like opioid and the rising house uh, uh, rising cost of housing you just seem like more and more homeless people and, and matter of fact in particular cities where it's becoming you know like epidemic right and so i like to be able to contribute to things where i see problems or it, it resonates with me so that's an example another example financially is if you're doing better and you have discretionary capital i like to be a big tipper Right. So when I go to restaurants and service and it's not always just people say, you know, like, you know, does somebody deserve a hundred dollar tip or whatever? It's like, well, sure they do. Like, look at this guy hustling his ass off here. It's not just what he's doing for us. Like, look what he's doing in this restaurant for everybody here. Right. Like and if, if you have discretionary capital, I have fun doing things like that. Right. And then here's the other twist I wanted to do and not to go all super, you know, geeky on you here, but what if you can get to a point in your own life where the things that are good for you are fun, right? How do you take something like food and nutrition, right? It's like, well, I don't know. And instead of, you know, maybe in your particular example, it's like, well, you know what, L like I'm going to partner with my wife and I know this would be great for you because she is like all about nutrition and healthy cooking and that kind of thing. So like, how about not only do we not do the chips, but we make a goal for February where we're going to cook healthy meals together. And so now we got bonding time. We've got like Dungeons and Dragons, but for you and your wife. And then the outcome is a healthy meal for the whole family. And guess what? It's not chips, right? And so there's an example. Or how about 
physical fitness. Now, I, 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 you know, it's not like I love to go to the gym every time that it's on my schedule and I go whether I love it or not. Right. Because I know I need to. But once you're in the gym and you're in a rhythm, most people are like, I don't want to most people, but a lot of people can get to the point where there's true joy, even in the pain. Right. Like I or maybe a better term would be like satisfaction. Right. Like I had to pull a sled a mile in my last workout, two 800 meter rounds, pulling a sled that had like, you know, I put 45 pounds and I said, oh, well, that was too late. And then I put another 25 pound plate on it. And halfway through, I was like, holy, you know, this is eating my lunch. But I got satisfaction by the time I got that sled back on the second round and satisfaction. I'm at the point in my life where satisfaction is fun for me. Like when I completed 75 hard, it, it, it was hard. Right. And there were parts of it that were fun, but mostly not. Right. And to look in the rear view mirror and look at that and say, you know, now I've created something. So again, my point here in closing would be when you can create, when you can create spaces in your life where the things that are good for you, maybe, maybe it's earning a higher income. Maybe it's eating better nutrition. Maybe it's spending more time with your family. When something that is good for you is fun, right? You're mixing it all up. And, and again, to put a bow on it, that's what I call lifestyle, creating lifestyle. Everything, everything you said is a big endorsement for what we do here at Team 212. Because yep. that is that is what has kept uh, keep keep <laughs> there we go uh, flub of the week right Hugo's yeah. flub of the week keep um, that is what has kept me focused in personal development for the past four plus years is gamifying it that's what we do we gamify personal development we gamify setting and completing goals and making progress on a weekly basis we gamify healthy habits we gamify connecting with your family. And that, you know, the other day I was in a meeting where we we're doing a planning session for a big project that we're, we're, we're going to be launching and we had to do sticky notes and what, what's important for you in, in this project. And for me, two words that I wrote, one is fun and two is the second word was games and game gamifying, you know, even getting, and not in a competitive way. I know some people get weird about being competitive. I love, I have fun being competitive. I enjoy right. it. I'm not the type of person who, when, when I lose, I'm upset or, you know, so some people get weird about competitiveness. I imagine like, I like being competitive. Like who can, who can reach out between me and my wife, who can text each other first, our, you know, our appreciation of the day, because that's yep. something we do. We, we text each other or leave each other voice memos with appreciation. So I like to gamify it and say, hi, I got you first. You know, <laughs> not, not in a negative way, but it, yeah. it makes me it fun. So I love everything you said about that. I think gamifying your finances, gamifying even, even your family interactions really enriches everything. And I've been on the receiving end of your giving, like, you know, unexpected, just like, Hey, here, I got this. I'll, I'll, I'll pay the tab. And it does, it is, it is amazing on both sides. So yeah, this was, you know, this is surprisingly one of the, the easiest topics to talk about for me mm -hmm. is, is just focus because I, I believe that what we focus on, and I, I, this is not something that I, I, this may be a Jim Rohn quote, I don't know, but what we focus on grows. And if we focus on the negative things that are going on in our life, which doesn't mean you have to be oblivious to them, but I'm talking about focus. People focus on that. If you focus on that, that will grow. If you focus on what's good, what's what you have to be grateful for, that will grow as well. So I'm glad that we had a chance to talk about this. Jeff, anything you want to say in closing? Well, I just maybe teeing up a future podcast episode. If we talked about what is the opposite of focus, right? A good word to use is distraction, right? And so that's a little bit what I was alluding to when I talked about social or TV, for example, you know, streaming video, right? But this right here is simultaneously a blessing and a curse in our life, right? It, it um, anyway, that that's that's where I would kind of leave us is is thinking about, as I was thinking about my talking points today for our focus conversation, oftentimes a good way for me to start is to think about the opposite of what we're gonna talk about. And then really what I would try and do is like build a case 
for focus and why it's important. And so I, I think we did a podcast in our first series uh, or whatever you refer to the season, right? Yeah. I, I I think we should really look at doing another episode on eliminating distractions, right? And then we can we could probably throw down on some, uh, you know, deep work, some Cal Newport. Have you ever read Cal Newport, like deep work? Absolutely. Yeah. And um, he has a uh, digital minimalism, I think. It oh, is. yeah. Right. Let's so talk anyway, about, I wrote distractions down. This is a big topic and something that I know we talked about, like you said, we talked about before, but new things have come on the scene. AI, distractions sure. are going to be everywhere. We are, we need to be on the defensive. So absolutely, we'll talk about that. Um, all right. So next week, we're going to talk about accountability and we'll actually get deeper and go into detail on what that gamification looks like. How do you gamify accountability so that you can make consistent progress and actually achieve your goals? So that's what we're going to talk about next week. Jeff, thank you so much. Everybody in the audience that stayed live, thank you so much. We will see you next week. Bye-bye.